back to the Michael Lofton show on reason and theology. You know, there's actually another dubia, a third dubia, um, which is a set of questions that were asked to the Pope that is really kind of being overlooked right now. And the reason why is what the main focus right now tends to be on the other two set of dubia that five cardinals submitted to the Pope, one in July and one in August. <clears throat> News of it broke yesterday, and I also covered it here on the show, so if you want my commentary on it, go and watch the two shows that I did yesterday, and you'll see my opinion on it. Now, um, but again, what's being overshadowed is yet another dubia that was approved at the same time that Pope Francis met with Cardinal Fernandez to give the green light to publish his response, that is Pope Francis's response, to the July dubia of the other five cardinals. So the same day he approved for that to be published, he also responded to another dubia from Cardinal Dominic Duca, Order of Preachers. Check, uh, Cardinal. And this is really a response to questions surrounding Amoris Laetitia, which is the document that came from the Synod on the Family and deals with the question of marriage and also divorce and remarried couples. And of course, you know that there has been a very large controversy surrounding this document that was released by Pope Francis. Some people interpret this to mean that Pope Francis just gives a green light for any divorced and remarried person to receive communion or for people who are living in a state of mortal sin to receive communion. Uh, both of those are not true, but that is often how some people depict that document. Now, I have gone into it in detail in another show called The Truth About Amor Satitia. If you want to go and watch it, I'll put it in the show notes. Certainly go and watch it. I go over it in detail. But the reason why I bring it up is because there was a dubia submitted um, by some of the cardinals who actually submitted these recent dubias uh, to Pope Francis. But there was a dubia submitted back in 2016, one of which, uh, one cardinal of which was um, Cardinal Mueller. I'm sorry, uh, Cardinal Burke. And he submitted a dubia to Pope Francis in 2016, asking him five different questions in relation to the document Amor Laetitia. <clears throat> and famously, Pope Francis never officially responded. Now, I do think that he has indirectly responded insofar as everything that was in there has already been answered. Four out of five of those questions were already answered in Amor Laetitia. So in reality, all one needs to do is go back and read Amor Laetitia more carefully, and they wouldn't have to ask those questions. But one of those questions uh, still remained, and Pope Francis has indirectly responded to it already. So that kind of put that issue to rest. But the, the approach that Pope Francis took of not directly responding and directly answering the dubia just remained in everyone's minds, and most people were just under the impression that he never responded really in any kind of way, directly or indirectly. But here now we have Pope Francis responding to a dubia about Amor Laetitia, which really covers the same ground and territory as the previous dubia. So by him responding to this, you're going to get the answers that you needed for the previous dubia. Not that he hasn't already answered them, but it's really killing two birds with one stone. So the um, reality of this happening is, is just monumental. And unfortunately, it's kind of sad that it's being overshadowed because we literally have a response to the Amor Sensitia dubia uh, just put into uh, different questions and asked by another cardinal. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. So we're going to go through it. We're going to read it together. The Vatican posted it yesterday on the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faiths website, uh, but it was in Italian only. And so I'm going to go into an English translation that uh, where Peter is actually put out. They put out an English translation. So we're going to look at that translation and we're going to go through it together. But first, let me remind you, hit that like button and especially the subscribe button. 
If you appreciate Reason and Theology, you think I'm doing good work here and more people need to see it, help me grow this channel by hitting the subscribe button so I can reach more people and also so that you can be aware of uh, new videos that I'm publishing. By the way, hit the bell for notifications so you know when I go live. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen and we're going to take a look at this new dubia that Pope Francis answered. And hopefully it's going to get some more traction and people are going to become aware of it. And, you know, people who have misjudged Pope Francis on this question, I hope and I expect for them to come out and publicly retract any claims that they've made about Pope Francis and to even apologize for any slander that they've engaged in based on lies that are now being corrected and, in fact, have already been corrected prior, prior to this. Um, now, if you look here, the document uh, begins here, responses to a series of questions proposed by His Eminence Cardinal Dominic Duca regarding the administration of the Eucharist of divorcees living in a new union. On July 13, 2023, a request was received by the Dicastery from His Eminence Cardinal Dominic Duca, Archbishop Emerita of uh, Prague, on behalf of Czech Bishops Conference. So the Czech Bishops Conference, he's doing this on behalf of them, which asks a number of questions regarding the administration of the Eucharist to divorcees living in a new union. Although some of the questions are drafted in an insufficiently clear manner, and therefore may harbor some inaccuracies. This department intends to answer them to help resolve the doubts raised by them. So, I mean, they're, they're on it. They're responding. And you'll notice this is under Fernandez that we're starting to get a ton of answers and more transparency from the Vatican. Um, something that I think is a breath of fresh air and I certainly welcome. Now, here's the first question. Is it possible for a diocese in an Episcopal Conference Union to make decisions completely independently, referring to the facts mentioned in questions two and three. Now, the response is the apostolic exhortation of Morsatitia, a document of the ordinary pontifical magisterium. So this is part of the Pope's magisterium. It is his authentic magisterium, so it's authoritative. It requires religious of submission of intellect and will. So Cardinal Burke, who says that it is, it is not magisterial, is mistaken. It is magisterial. Not only is it magisterial if you just simply understand what the magisterium is and how it works, but it's also magisterial according to the magisterium itself. So, and, and so it continues a document of the ordinary pontifical magisterium towards which all are called to offer the submission of intellect and will uh, states that presbyters have the task of accompanying the persons concerned on the path of discernment, according to the teaching of the church and the ori orientations of the bishop. In this sense, it is possible, indeed desirable, for the ordinary of a diocese, ordinary is usually a bishop, to establish certain criteria that, in line with the church teaching, can help priests in the accompaniment and discernment of divorced persons living in a new union. Now we're going to start to get into the nitty gritty, though. Here's question number two. Can Pope Francis's response to the question from the pastoral region of the Diocese of Buenos Aires, and by the way, if you're not familiar with this, go and watch my video, Truth About Amor Satitia. I go into this document in detail. Given that the text was published in the Acta Apostolica Sedis, be considered an affirmation of the church's ordinary magisterium. So does this document that Pope Francis approved of, is that part of the magisterium? <clears throat> I'm not sure why it was necessary to ask this because it's already been abundantly clear. The answer is yes. As stated in the rescript accompanying the two documents on the Apo, uh, Acta Apostolica Sedis, these are published as authentic magisterium. So, yes, it is magisterial. You cannot deny it. And religious submission of intellect and will is owed to the teachings in them. Okay. Um, it continues with the third question. Is this a decision of the ordinary magisterium of the church based on the document Amoris Laetitia? And it answers, as the Holy Father recalls in his letter to the delegate of the Buenos Aires pastoral region, Amoris Laetitia was the result of the work and prayer of the whole church with the me mediation of two synods and the Pope. The document builds on the magisterium of previous pontiffs, 
who already recognized the possibility for divorcees in new unions to have access to the Eucharist as long as they make a commitment to live in full continence, that is, to abstain from the acts proper to spouses, as was proposed by John Paul II, or to commit themselves to live their relationship as friends, as proposed by Benedict XVI. Francis maintains the proposal of full continence for the divorce and remarried in a new union. Did you hear that? He maintains the proposal that they live pure for the divorce and remarried in a new union. But he admits there may be difficulties in practicing it. And there are some circumstances that could certainly be raised to illustrate this. Um, again, if you take a look at my video, The Truth About Amor Satitia, I go into some of those. And therefore allows in certain cases after proper discernment, the administration of the sacrament of reconciliation, even when one fails in being faithful to the continence proposed by the church. Did you hear that? He didn't say Eucharist. It says reconciliation. Why is that important? This vindicates exactly what I have been saying about Amor Satitia, contrary to all of the other people who have been saying otherwise and all of the naysayers. This completely vindicates what I've said. What was the problem? Well, one thing that Amor Laetitia was doing, it wasn't giving the green light, hey, anybody who's living in mortal sin can receive communion. No, the document is very clear to guard against that. What the document, however, was doing is somebody who's objectively in a state of sin. We're not even speaking yet of their personal level of culpability. We're just saying objectively they're in a state of grave sin. That person is able to go to confession in some situations where they haven't left the home of this new union. Perhaps they haven't left the home, so they're still there. They're still there with the person that they've contracted this new union with. Um, and obviously that's going to be, in some cases, a near occasion of sin, right? Well, does that mean that they can't go to confession? This was a question that a lot of people had, and some confessors were saying they can't receive absolution because to have a firm purpose of amendment, you have to leave. And what they're saying is that in some situations, by leaving, you'll actually make the situation even worse. So though you need to practice um, being pure and living as brothers and sisters, to go to confession doesn't necessarily require that you leave. That's just one example. And you can see precedent for that in John Paul II. But again, there were some people still struggling. But can we actually give them absolution if they're still in this near occasion, even though you've already had this decision from John Paul II? Uh, Pope Francis is reiterating, yes, yes, because you could still have a firm purpose of amendment, even if you're still living in that situation in particular cases. And we would have to go through what those particular cases are. So you'll notice the document doesn't just say, hey, they can just go to con they, they can just immediately go and receive the Eucharist and they don't have to confess their sins. And it doesn't say, hey, it's perfectly fine if you're in a state of mortal sin to receive the Eucharist. That isn't what it says. You'll note it says exactly what I was saying. They are able to go to confession. I'll read it to you again. Therefore, Pope Francis. He tells them to remain fully continent, but allows in certain cases, after proper discernment, the administration of reconciliation, even when one fails in being faithful to the continents proposed by the church. So obviously, if you're still living together, that could be a near occasion of sin. And what's going to happen? Sometimes some people are going to fall. So then the question is, well, if they come to confession, can they be given absolution without leaving that home, especially if they have children together? Are you going to require them to leave that home if they have children together just to receive absolution? The answer in some cases is no, they could still receive absolution, even though they might still fall into that sin. They still have an intention, however, not to. And that is sufficient for them to receive absolution. So Amor Laetitia never says two things that people always falsely attribute, attribute to it. And number one, never says a, a person who's divorced and remarried, regardless of circumstances, they can just go straight to communion. 
they don't need to go to confession. Never says that. It guards against that, in fact. And number two, it never says a person who is in a state of mortal sin can go, go and receive the Eucharist without confession first. Never. Never. It guards against that. The real controversy was, can people in these circumstances who are going to fall, possibly, and maybe have fallen, can they receive absolution without leaving the home in some cases? The answer was yes, they can. And thus, once they go to reconciliation, then they can receive the Eucharist. And if they fall again, they need to go to confession first before they can receive again. That's not revolutionary. That's Catholic moral theology. But it's dealing with unique circumstances, or not unique circumstances, but rare circumstances. Perhaps a spouse has been abandoned unjustly. And this spouse, they're not the one who left the marriage, uh, but they've been abandoned. The other spouse has contracted a new union. They, after a while, contract a new union. So they're in a second marriage and something that is not uh, permitted. Uh, so they're objectively in a state of sin. Now, the question is, let's say they have children together. And what if their new spouse says, if you do not have the marital act with me, if you don't engage in the marital act with me, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to take the children and I'm going to raise them according to my religious beliefs, which might be paganism or something else like that. You could imagine a husband in that situation, or it could be the other way around. It could be a wife. You can imagine a spouse in that situation might feel like, well, I don't know. This actually might do more harm than good for me to completely leave this union. And though it's not right, you could understand how there could be some mitigating factors in their decision making. So though it's still a sin, the question is, do they have full consent of the will? And in such circumstances, no, they have a reduction in culpability. That doesn't mean that they get to go straight to conf uh, the Eucharist, however. They still need to go to confession. But some were arguing, no, they can't go to confession. They have to completely leave. That's what Amor Slitsitio was really about, dealing with those kinds of situations. Now, you might not like that example. I just made that example up. There, there could be other examples. Uh, there are some that Amor Slitsitio brings up. But those are, those are some scenarios. Um, so take it or leave it on that particular one. But you can see it's addressing kind of rare circumstances where you have to accompany a person and work with them and um, do the best with them to bring them to the sacraments, especially reconciliation. Okay, so that right there puts to death all of the liars and slanderers. I'm, I'm, and I'm not done. We're going to read more. But everybody who has been lying and saying that a mors letizia means people who are in mortal sin get to receive communion, or people who have been lying and saying, Pope Francis says that divorce and remarried people, you know, regardless of circumstances, can receive communion. That's a lie. It's slander. And I expect the public figures who have been promoting those lies and this slander, I expect them to come out and apologize to Pope Francis for this. Now, as I said, prior to this dubia, this information was already there. I had access to it. I showed it to y'all in the Truth About Amor Satitia and I already showed you from what's available. We could already know this is what Pope Francis was saying. But to make it abundantly clear for anyone who's still confused, this dubia has been provided. So I guess we can anticipate all of the slanderers out there to come out and apologize to Pope Francis. And I guess we'll never hear about the controversy of Amor Satitia anymore since they were proven wrong, right? Right? Wow. I'm not going to hold my breath. Let's continue, though, and let's look at the rest of the document. The fourth question is, is it the intention of Amor Slitizia to institutionalize this solution through an official permission or decision to individual couples? Point one of the document, basic criteria for the implementation of Chapter 8 of Amor Satizia expressly states, we should remember that it is not advisable to speak of permissions to have access to sacraments, but of discernment, a discernment process in the company of a pastor. It is a personal, personal and pastoral discernment. It is therefore a pastoral accompaniment as an exercise of the way of charity, which is nothing but an invitation to follow the way of Jesus of mercy and integration. The more Satitia opens the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation in the Eucharist. 
And that is um, that is actually pointing to a Morse Laetitia that explicitly says that of reconciliation in the Eucharist, not Eucharist alone, confession in the Eucharist. When in particular cases, there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and guilt. In other words, when they're no longer, when they're not actually in a state of mortal sin, because they have a reduction in culpability and it's reduced to a venial sin. When it's reduced to a venial sin, though they're objectively in a state of grave sin, though personally they might be reduced to venial, they still need to go to confession before they receive the Eucharist. On the other hand, this process of accompaniment does not necessarily end with the sacraments, but can be directed towards other forms of integration into the life of the church. Because in some cases, they might not be the abandoned spouse, for example. They could be the one who abandoned their spouse and thus have a duty to restore that previous union if possible. So in some cases, it might not be that they get to receive the Eucharist. They might have to do some things first to make the situation right. A greater presence in the community participation and prayer or if it reflection groups or involvement in various church services. Okay. Fifth question. Who should be the evaluator of the given situation of the couple in question? Any confessor? Local parish priest? A vicar, Episcopal, uh, Episcopal vicar or penitentiary? It involves initiating an itinerary of pastoral accompaniment for the discernment of each individual person. And more so, Titia emphasizes that all priests have the responsibility to accompany the persons concerned on the path of discernment. And that's because they are confessors, right? It is the priest who welcomes the person, listens to him attentively, and shows him the maternal face of the church. Welcoming his right intention and good purpose to place his whole life in the light of the gospel and to practice charity. But it is each person individually who is called to stand before God and expose to him his conscience with its possibilities and limitations. This conscience, accompanied by a priest and enlightened by the church's guidelines. So listen to that. You, you don't just say, well, my conscience tells me. No, your conscience has to be formed by the church's guidelines, by its magisterium, and the help of the church through the help of a priest who guides you and helps form your conscience. This conscience, accompanied by a priest and enlightened by the church's guidelines, is called to be formed in order to evaluate and make a judgment sufficient to discern the possibility of access to the sacraments. In situations where there hasn't been a declaration of nullity, perhaps it's impossible to receive one for practical reasons, not because it's not, um, you know, actually possible to grant one insofar as there couldn't be a declaration of nullity, but practically, for whatever reason, there are practical problems preventing the uh, technical process to go through. Um, through that, uh, through a process of discernment um, and enlightened by the church's guidelines, a person in certain circumstances may discern that they're able to access reconciliation and then the Eucharist. But reconciliation first. Never, ever, ever does it say Eucharist alone and you don't ever have to go to confession. It never says that. In fact, the guidelines always mention confession first. And again, the, pre, the other um, question three made it very clear, explicitly, they need to go to reconciliation first. Okay. Number six, would it be appropriate for these cases to be handled by the appropriate ecclesiastical court? In cases where it is, where it is possible to establish a declaration of nullity, um, recourse to the ecclesiastical tribunal will be part of the discernment process. In other words... If you have the opportunity to receive or to seek a declaration of nullity from the tribunal, then that's where you need to go. You can't just go to a priest and say, hey, I feel like in my conscience I can go and receive a reconciliation. And then the Eucharist, no, 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 no. You need to go through the process of an annulment. Now, what do you do about cases where you actually can't go to an ecclesiastical tribunal? For some technical reason, they're not available, whatever. There are instances where that happens. That's that's where a more Laetitia kicks in. The Holy Father wanted to simplify these processes with the motu proprio mitis iudix. The problem arises in the more complex situations where none is possible to obtain a declaration of nullity. In these cases, a discernment process that stimulates or renews a personal encounter with Jesus Christ also in the sacraments may be possible. So where there isn't a tribunal available, 
they could go through this discernment process. And in some cases, it doesn't end with them receiving the Eucharist, as we read. In other cases, they might be able to go to confession and then receive the Eucharist. Just depends on the circumstance. There's no one size fits all here because there are different circumstances and there are different levels of culpability. And there are different ways where, where some people are more obligated to restore a previous uh, union than others, especially the one who actually abandoned the, uh, the, the union. Okay. Can this principle be applied to both parties to a civilly divorced marriage or distinguish the degree of fault and proceed accordingly? St. John Paul II already stated that the judgment on the state of grace, of course, belongs only to the person concerned since it is an evaluation of conscience. So do we have the church's guidelines to determine whether or not we're in a state of grace? Yes, we do. But ultimately, the uh, conclusion of determining whether I as an individual am in a state of grace whether I personally um, am, am, am fully culpable and was fully knowledgeable, that's an evaluation of conscience. And that ultimately depends on the person's conscience to discern. So I can't say that so-and-so is in a state of mortal sin with any kind of objective certainty. Uh, no, I, I, I can't. I can, I can have a good idea that somebody might be in a state of mortal sin, but I, I can't really know that a person actually is. That's something that they have to evaluate in their own conscience. I can know that they're living in grave sin insofar as what they're doing is grave matter, but I can't discern their level of culpability and knowledge perfectly as, as, as an outsider. I, I can try to help them make decisions and judge that, but ultimately they as the individual have to judge that. And that's what this document is saying. Therefore, it is a process of individual discernment. So it's not ultimately up to the, the priest. It's ultimately up to the individual to discern with the guide, guidance of the priest and the guidelines of the church. Therefore, it is a process of individual discernment in which remarried divorcees should ask themselves how they behave towards their children. When the marital union entered a crisis, whether there were any attempts at reconciliation. This, this is just straight from Amor Santizia. The situation of the partner abandoned. Um, were there any attempts at reconciliation? The situation of the partner, partnership abandoned. Uh, what consequences the new relationship has on the rest of the family? And the community of the faithful. What example it sets for young people who are to prepare for marriage? Sincere reflection can strengthen trust in God's mercy, which is to which is denied to no one. Eighth question. In the case of this single permission, should it be understood that married life, that is the sexual aspect, should not be mentioned in the sacrament of reconciliation? The answer is, even in the sacrament of marriage, the sex life by spouses is subject to examination of conscience to confirm that it is a true expression of love and helps growth in love. All aspects of life should be placed before God. Mm. Wouldn't it be appropriate for the whole matter to be better explained in the text of your competent department? The answer is based on the words of the Holy Father in his letter of the response of the delegate of pastoral region of Buenos Aires, in which he stated that there are no other interpretations. It seems that the matter is sufficiently explained in the aforementioned document. So reading this document is pretty important. Again, I covered it in the Truth About a Mosotitia video. How to proceed to establish internal unity, but also not disturb the ordinary magisterium of the church. Okay, so the, the answer is, it would be appropriate for the Bishop's Conference to agree on some minimum criteria in order to implement the proposals of a Amor Letizia that would help priests in the process of accompaniment and discernment. Regarding the possible access to the sacraments of some divorcees in a new union, without prejudice to the legitimate authority that each bishop has in his own diocese. Okay, the big kicker, however, was what we saw right there in the end of number three that put to death even though it had already been put to death this once again puts to death the narrative the myth the lie that pope francis just approves community for divorce or remarried or pope francis it says it's okay for a people who are in mortal sin to receive communion or pope francis just says that divorce and remarried can go straight to the eucharist they don't need to go to confession all of these are lies and the third question and third answer right there once again shows that. So, you know, in a way, the Morse Letizia controversy um, should be over at this point. But as you know, unfortunately, it probably won't be.
we saw the Pachamama hoax was just that. It was a hoax. And yet people still bring it up every day. Um, we see now that Morsa Tsitsia and the whole controversy surrounding it based on a lot of lies. And unfortunately, I think some people are still going to continue with the narrative. However, what we can do is we can present the truth to people. So when we see somebody promoting the lie, we can show them the truth. Perhaps send them to this document. Perhaps send them to this video. If they have questions about a more Tsitsia, perhaps send them the video that I did where I did a presentation on it. And this vindicates my explanation of it. Um, so certainly share those things. Because I imagine you're still going to hear about it. Especially because this dubia is being overshadowed. People don't even know that it happened. There literally is an answer to the Amor Satitia dubia right here. Because the answers that we received here covers the 2016 one as well. I hope this was helpful. If it was, hit that subscribe button so I can reach more people with the truth because people right now are shouting the lies from the rooftop and we need to be more vocal with speaking the truth. And to be just as aggressive in presenting the truth as others are in promoting lies. Help me do that by hitting the subscribe button so I can reach more people with this message. So if you think that this was something people need to hear, do your part. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button too and comment. Let me know in the comment section what you thought about this video. D did you find it helpful? Do you think that there's still questions remaining? If so, what are they? Um, you know, put that kind of stuff in the comment section so I could get some good feedback from you. I would certainly appreciate it. Also, let me know in the comment section, did you actually hear about this dubia prior to me telling, uh, you, telling you about it? Did you already hear about this or was this new information to you? I suspect it was overshadowed by the other controversies, uh, that have been taking place in the last 24 hours or so. Again, if you want my take on those other videos, on those other dubia that I did yesterday, I'll put a link to those in the show notes. Go and watch those. I think you'll enjoy them. All right. Hit that subscribe button. Also check me out. Patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to financially support me, or I'm going to put a GoFundMe link and a PayPal link there in the show notes. If you would rather use those platforms, I would greatly appreciate your support though. All right. We'll see you later. God bless. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works with encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things? It's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course, Understanding the Magisterium, for more information. Hey everybody, I'm so excited to announce I have begun an Eastern Catholic podcast that is affiliated with God With Us Radio. God With Us Radio is part of an Eastern Catholic faith formation program put on by the Eastern Catholic Bishops of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And so God With Us Radio is putting out a lot of great catechetical material for Eastern Catholics so that people grow in their faith and they learn about the Eastern tradition in communion with Rome. And that's what I'm doing with this podcast, affiliated with God With Us Radio. It is called Union Without Confusion. If you go to unionwithoutconfusion.com, you'll see a list of episodes. And you will also see a new episode at least once a week on Mondays at 5 p.m. Central. So I encourage you, go to unionwithoutconfusion.com to take a look at the podcast and enjoy great content that focuses on the Eastern tradition in communion with Rome. I hope you'll check out the website and be blessed by the material. Please pray for this new endeavor. We'll see you later. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.